we're going to do something that's uh, I haven't taught this for several years and people have been asking me to teach it. And I, and I think beings were living in the time when God wants to make himself a, a bride without spot, wrinkle or blemish that I should teach the Song of Solomon again, because I believe it's one of the most misunderstood books in the Bible. Uh, and people try to make it mean things that had no intention of meaning. So uh, today's is going to be kind of an introduction, and then next Saturday also at this time will be a, a partial introduction, and we'll start in it. But this way you can tell all your friends if they want to listen to the a good, solid teaching on the Song of Solomon, encourage them to come. My first question is this. Who knows? Who can tell me the answer to how many songs Solomon wrote? She got it right. Let's give a hand, Lita Ray. It was 1,005, and she knew that. He wrote 1,005 songs. Okay, let's look at the cast of characters in the Song of Solomon. I want you to think of it as like a play. And here are the characters. You have King Solomon. You're going to see there's also a shepherd. There's also the Shulamite. Then there's her family. And you have the daughters of Jerusalem. All of these have speaking parts. OK, now then you're also going to see Solomon's entourage, but they don't have a speaking part. OK, so the other ones, that reminds me of a joke. <laughs> there was this little Jewish boy and he was so excited he got to be in the school play. And so he goes running home and he says, Mama, Mama, guess what? I get to be in the school play. And she says, well, that's fantastic, Yaakov. I've always wanted you to have to memorize lines. What part are you going to play? He says, I get to be the Jewish father. She goes, what? You go back and tell your teacher you want a speaking part. Uh, just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. <clears throat> so now here we go. Here is the, the plot. As the plot thickens here in the play. And this is where you, I depart from a lot of your traditional thinking, and you're going to see why. King Solomon is enticing the Shulamite with all that the world has to offer. Yet the Shulamite is being pulled away with cords of love by a shepherd who would be king. I don't believe the king and the shepherd in this story is the same person, because you're going to find as we go next week, she says, the king has drawn me into his chambers. He knows who the king is. But then a few verses later, she hears about this shepherd and she wants to know where he makes his he makes his flock to rest at noon. And so I believe these are two different characters. And uh, it's I believe it's a prophetic story of the Messiah wooing his bride to fulfill her calling and being one with him and working the harvest together. One of the keys to understanding this book is to know who is doing the talking. Now, one of the key things to realize is she always refers to him as my beloved. You're going to see that in Song of Solomon, chapter five, verse four. She says, my beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door. My bowels are moved for him. So obviously you can put my beloved and his together and it's her talking and she's referring to him as her beloved. Does everyone catch that? This is going to be so vital because if you don't get this and you don't know who do the talking, you get all messed up. Now, he always refers to her as my love. Song of Solomon 4, one. He says, behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are like dove's eyes from behind your veil. OK, so if someone is saying my beloved, who's talking? And if someone says my love, who's talking? He is. OK, now, now look at Song of Solomon 2.10. First, you'll see she's speaking, but then she, he's speaking. She says, my beloved spoke and said unto me. OK, so that's her speaking. But now he's speaking. And he said to her, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. So you got the basic principle now. So you know who's speaking. This is vital. You're also going to see the story is divided into six different acts. The first one, you, in, it starts with chapter 1, verse 2, and goes through 2, 7. And you're going to see how double-minded she is. She can't decide. Does she want to go with Solomon, or does she want to go with the shepherd? And she falls asleep. Okay? And then in the second section, which starts with chapter 2, verse 8, and goes through chapter 3, verse 5, the shepherd is calling her to himself and to his work. And what does she do? She falls asleep again. 
And then thirdly uh, is the hunt. She is now playing hide and seek. She's searching for her beloved in chapter three, verse six through five, two. And it ends with her doing what? Falling asleep again. Now, doesn't that sound like the church or the bride? OK, falling asleep, falling asleep, falling asleep. And he's trying to get her to work the harvest. And so then the fourth act, you see the Shulamite searches for her beloved again in chapter five, verse three through six, ten. And this time we see true repentance. And then the fifth section, the Shulamite joins her beloved actually working the harvest. And that's in six, eleven through eight, four. And that's where she finally really, truly enters into rest. And then lastly, the Shulamite enjoys full communion with the shepherd in chapter eight, verse five through 14, eight, 14. Speaking of she's completely set apart and she is sanctified. And so we see in Song of Solomon one, one, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's and first Kings four thirty two, it says Solomon spoke three thousand proverbs and his songs were. A thousand and five. Now, did you look at the bottom of the page or did you already know that later? Yeah, she knew that. Now, here's the next thing. I want to set the historical background so you can see why I take the path that I take on this uh, book here. In 1 Samuel 8, 7 through 21, here we see Israel has been wanting a king like all the nations have. But God was their king. And so this is this is the background of this. I believe this whole story is God wants to take them away from a human king and bring them back to him, the true shepherd of their souls. Okay, see, he never wanted them to have a king like all the nations have. And so look here and look what it says in verse 7 through 21. It says, the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they've done since the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day. Works with which they have forsaken me and served other gods. So they do also to you. Now, listen to their voice. But look what God said. God should have, could have said, OK, Fine, be that way. I'll see you later. But God wasn't like that. He said, listen to what they said, but please first show them. Show them, Samuel, what this horrible king, what, the, what kings will be like. He says, only you shall surely protest solemnly to them and show them the kind of king that will reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked a king of him. And he said this, this is going to be the privilege of the king who shall reign over you. He's going to take your sons and appoint them for himself. For his chariots and his horsemen, and they shall run before his chariots. He will appoint commanders over thousands, commanders over fifty, some to plow his ground and reap his harvest and make his weapons of war and weapons for his chariots. And he's going to take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He's going to take your fields, your vineyards, your olive yards, the best. And they're going to give them to his servants. He's going to take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give it to his eunuchs and to his servants. And then he's going to take your male slaves and your slave girls and your finest young men. And he's going to take your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. And then look what it says. You shall cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. And the Lord will not answer you in that day. The Lord will not answer, it says. And what did it say? Even after Samuel told him all that, it says the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no. We will have a king over us and we shall be also we like all the nations so that our king may judge us, go out before us and fight our battles. So Samuel heard all the words of the people and repeated them in the ears of the Lord. Do you think God was happy that they had a king? I don't think so. And so now, which king fulfilled these things in particular? Let's look at first Kings 922. Solomon did not make any slaves out of the sons of Israel. But what did he do? It says they were men of war and they were his servants and his rulers and his commanders and rulers of his chariots and his horsemen. They were the chief of the officers who were over Solomon's work. Five hundred and fifty ruled over the people who labored in the work. Now, what did the people think of Solomon's rule? Remember, his son was what was his son's name? Rehoboam. Right. And remember when Solomon died. You have Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and they're trying to decide, are we going to become one nation or two? And so it says this. They said, uh, Rehoboam, in 1 Kings 12, 9 through 11, it says, He said unto them, What advice do you give that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Okay, so Rehoboam is who's speaking, and the people are speaking to Rehoboam about his dad, Solomon. 
And they said this, lighten the yoke which your father put on us. And the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, so shall you speak to this people who spoke to you, saying, your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter for us. So you shall say to them, my little finger will be thicker than my father's loins. And now my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, and I'm going to add to your yoke. My father has whipped you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Now, did you know Solomon did that? Okay, I mean, that was their basic, their attitude. And then let's look at 1 Kings 5, 12. It says the Lord did give Solomon wisdom, or he gave Solomon wisdom, as he promised him. And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon. And then look what it says. And they, too, made a what? The word there in Hebrew is Brit, a covenant. And God had told them, don't make covenants. And here God's saying, I gave him wisdom, but look what he did. It says, King Solomon raised a levy out of all Israel. And the levy was how many men? 30,000 men. It says, he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month by courses. The month they were in Lebanon, two months at home. And Idanarayim was over the levy. And then it says, Solomon had 70,000 that bear burdens, 80,000 hewers in the mountains. Uh, beside the chief of Solomon's officers, which were over the work, there was 3,300, which ruled over the people. So he's got all these people that are involved in the labor. Now, let's go look at Deuteronomy 7, 1, 2. And remember, this was written 500 years before Solomon. It says, when the Lord your God shall bring you to the land where you go to possess it, and he casts out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you, and the Lord your God shall deliver them before you, you shall crush them, completely destroy them, and you shall make no covenant with them. That's Brett, same word. And Hiram was not of them. And then look at First Chronicles 28, 11 through 19. The other thing I want to point out, David gave to his son Solomon the pattern of the porch. So David had the pattern, and he gave Solomon the pattern of the porch and of its houses, the pattern of the treasuries, the pattern of the upper rooms, the pattern of the innermost rooms, the place of the mercy seat, the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit, uh, the courts of the house of the Lord, and of all the rooms around the treasury. So David had all the pattern, and he gave it to Solomon. Do we see that? And go down to the very bottom of that. It says, everything was in writing from the hand of the Lord. David says he made me understand all the work of this pattern. So the entire pattern was actually given to David. And David gave it to his son Solomon. Then we see in 1 Chronicles 29, look at what David says. David the king said to all the congregation, Solomon, my son... Whom alone God has chosen is young and tender, and the work is great, for the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. And David says this, I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God. What did he prepare? He prepared the gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, the bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron, wood for the things of wood, onyx stones. You know, and goes on, it says, everything in abundance. And then I have here, and also because I have delighted in the house of my God out of my own treasure of gold and silver, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. And he lists all these thousands of talents of gold and silver that he has. And then halfway down there it says, and who is willing to consecrate his service this day to the Lord? And so we see the chiefs of the fathers, the rulers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and hundreds with the rulers of the king's work offered willingly, and they gave. And so uh, drop down to where it has verse 16 to the left at the bottom there. It says, David says, O Lord, our God, all of this store that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. So look at David's attitude. I mean, even though a lot of it came from his own treasuries and everyone else's treasuries, everyone acknowledges that all of this really came from who? God. And so he's supplying almost everything that is needed for the temple. And then in verse 19, he says, and give to Solomon, my son, a perfect heart to keep your commandments, your testimonies, your statutes, to do all these things and to build the magnificent house for which what I have. So David basically did all the work. He got the pattern. He supplied the pattern. He got all the material. He's made everything ready. There are some things that need to be done. And then look at what happens in first Kings six one. Now, if you were Solomon and, and you knew this was uh, from the you really felt like this was from the Lord and your David and your father, David, asked you to do this. And he's given you the pattern, and all the material. How soon after you began your reign, would you start? Let's look at first Kings six one. It happened in the four hundred and eightieth year after the sons of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt. 
In the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziph, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. It was four years later. He didn't even, what, what's going on here? Well, let's look at 1 Kings 6, 37 and 38. In the fourth, he had to get permits. He went, worked for King County, he was probably over there. That's what it was. Had to get permits. Okay, it says, in the fourth year, in the month of Ziph, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. And then it says, in the eleventh year, the month Bull, which is currently Cheshvan, which is the month after Tishri, which is the eighth month, the house was finished as to all its parts and as to all its plans. So he was seven years in building it. Okay, so he didn't start till the fourth year of his reign. And how many years did it take to build? Okay, why do you think it took so long and why did he wait to build it? Well, let's look at First Kings 7, 1 Kings 7.1. Solomon was 13 years building his own house. And he finished all of his house. Oh, and in verse 2, he also built the house of the force of Lebanon. The length thereof was 100 cubits, breadth 50 cubits, the height thereof 30 cubits. And, and then, of course, not only did he have to build his own house, he had to build the house of the force of Lebanon. And then in 1 Kings 7 and 8, he also had to build a house for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he married. He's got a, he's just got a, you know, he's got a lot of things to do here. It's not just the Lord's house, for heaven's sake. He's got to build everyone else's and for Pharaoh's daughters who he wasn't supposed to marry. Now, in Psalms 127.1, listen to this. I believe David wrote this and he wrote it for who? That's how it begins. This is a song of degrees and it's for Solomon. I can just imagine David is telling Solomon before he goes, unless the who, the Lord build the house They what labor in vain who build it unless the Lord keeps the city. The watchman stays awake in vain. Okay, so the David is telling him, look, I know that all this came from the Lord, everything that I had and the pattern. And I give all the glory to the Lord. And I'm telling you, son, he says, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. It's not you that's going to build this thing. It's not your labor. It's going to be the Lord. And so here is uh, Solomon's dedication prayer. Now, remember David's attitude. Remember, he's the one that provided the plans and much of the material, you know, and who built it. Remember the 30,000 people that were helping to build it and all this kind of stuff. Here was the dedicatory prayer by Solomon in Second Chronicles 6. Solomon said, the Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness and I have built a house for you to live in. Isn't it interesting? How many of you like uh, the when you do all the work and your boss gets all the credit? In verse 18 of that same chapter. He says, but truly will God indeed dwell with men on earth. Behold, heaven, the heavens of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this house, which I have built. Verse 32 through 34. And he says, and also to the stranger who is not of your people, Israel, but has come from a far country for your great namesake and your mighty hand and your stretched out arm. If they come and pray to this house, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do according to all that the stranger calls to you. Or so that all the people of the earth may know your name and fear you as your people, Israel. And may know that this house, which... I have built is called by your name. If your people go out to war against their enemies by the way that you shall send them. And if they pray to you toward the city which you have chosen and the house which I have built for your name. Verse 38. If they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, where they have carried them captives. If they pray toward their land, which you gave their fathers toward the city, which you have chosen and toward the house, which I have built. Now, this is a beautiful prayer. and There's a lot of wonderful things in there and just and I think it's gorgeous. But do you sense there's any self involved? Do you pick that up? Yes. And they call it God's temple. It's all in the temple. No. But anyway, I just think it, how many of us sometimes want to interject self into the things of God? And I think that's one of the things God wants to do. I mean. You know, all of us, I believe, can say godly things and do godly things, but God wants to, us to die to self. He wants us to get the self out of it. And here's, I believe, is a truly God's word, but I have a sense of he was kind of trying to take all the credit. And what, what was David's prayer? He said, unless the Lord builds the house, they what? Labor in vain. Look at Solomon's very words after the temple was done. Ecclesiastes 2.11, he says, I looked on all the works that my hands have done and on the labor that I've labored to do. And behold, all is what? Why? Because he built it. Does that make sense? He says it's all vanity. Even the building of the temple, he says, is vanity because he's the one that built it, you know, per se. Actually, everybody else built it, you know. And he says, in vexation of spirit, there's no profit under the sun. And so we'll close with this verse here. 
in First Chronicles 17, 4 through 7. This is what God says. He says, go and tell David, my servant. See, David was first a what? A shepherd who became king. Solomon was a king who didn't understand the heart of a shepherd. He didn't have that background. He didn't have that training. And so God wants to be a shepherd king. And he says, go and tell David, my servant, so says the Lord, you shall not build me a house to dwell in. For I have not dwelt in the house since the day I brought up Israel today. But I've gone from tent to tent, from one tabernacle to another. Wherever have I walked with all Israel? He says, did I speak a word to any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to do what? So what did he want his shepherds to do? Feed my sheep. Remember that term? Feed my sheep. Three times in John, what did he say? Feed my sheep. That's what the concern has always been for God, is a shepherd who will feed his sheep, not fleece his sheep. Okay? And, and God says this, Did I ever speak a word to any of the judges of Israel, whom what my commandment was to feed my sheep, saying to them, Why have you not built me a house of cedars? Was, Dave, was God lacking a house? Did God really need the house? That, that wasn't his desire. That was David's desire. But God will give us the desires of our heart. God always wanted to dwell in temporary dwelling places. Why? Because we are the temple, too. We are a temporary dwelling place. God's heart has been to be in from tabernacle to tabernacle. He wants to dwell in all of us. OK, so it wasn't God's desire to have a temple. It was man's desire. And God says, and now you shall say this to my servant, David. So says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep so that you would be ruler over my people, Israel. He wants a shepherd. OK, in John 21, 15 through 17 is where God had always told Peter three times what? Feed my sheep. So God is looking for humble people who will serve him and love his people, shepherds who will feed his sheep. So that's what the I'm going to have a little bit more of an introduction next week on the Song of Solomon. Uh, but you're going to see it's, it's completely different than what many of you may have thought. Uh, it's, it's quite a story. So at this time, the singers come up. One of the things that we're also going to do uh, after this closing song and the ironic benediction, I'm going to have uh, Dan and Debbie Meeks and Linda Pikart come up. This is their last service with us. They're moving to Florida. And so we want to pray for them and uh, send them on their way with a blessing. So those of you after we're done want to come up and we're going to lay hands on them. And pray for them and ask that the Lord would uh, truly be with them and protect them and help them find a, a good location uh, down there in sunny Florida. Where in Florida are you going? Boca Raton. Well, let's stand. Father, we just uh, thank you so much for your word. Father, I pray that you would truly enlighten our eyes over the next few weeks as we begin to uh, look into your word. And for this coming Monday night, as we uh, see how Yeshua is revealed in the Torah. And for the, the next several weeks, as we go through the Torah on Shabbat mornings, and as we go through the Song of Solomon, we would, uh, you would speak to us and tell us what your calling and your purpose is for us in these uh, final days that we're living in. Father, we ask that you would be with us, that you would hold our hand. Father, that you would truly shepherd us and feed us according to your word in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Lord, we just want to serve you. We just want to be your servants. Father, we just want to receive from you, receive food from you, and in turn, feed others. We just thank you so much for that word, that living word, that bread of life. For your river of life, Father, that your water may flow through each one of us, that we may truly bring water to thirsty people, to a thirsty land who are out there seeking you. In Yeshua's name, amen. Uh, we're going to say the ironic benediction, but you want to go ahead and come on up? And uh, would Lewis, could you grab three chairs and kind of put them here for me for them to sit on? And we'll have Dan and Deborah. And where's Linda? Yeah, come on up and yeah, kind of face them out that way. Yeah, go ahead and have a seat here. Well, yeah, if you, want to, if you want to sit down in case there's people that want to come up and pray for you guys as well. 
Let's take a moment. Let's first pray for them, and then we'll do the ironic benediction. Father, we just thank you so much for this trio, Father, that is being sent out. Father, as they're going out from us to Florida, we pray that your spirit, your Ruach HaKodesh, would go with them. Father, that you would fill them with your presence, that you would fill them with your love, that you would fill them with your wisdom, with your insight. Father, that they truly would hear from you. Father, that you would keep them safe in their travels as they go. Father, that uh, the traveling would be safe. Father, they would land safely. Father, that uh, everything would just fall into place quickly as far as uh, places to stay and Father, as far as places to go and to worship with you, that you would just lead them to the perfect place that would be just for them. Father, keep them in touch with your people. Keep them in touch with us. Father, that that, even though they're across the United States, that connection will always be there. Father, we just thank you for them. Be with them. Comfort them. Father, even it's a big step uh, to move away from friends and family and to go clear across the U.S. So, Father, we pray that the going would be smooth. Father, that you would make the path plain. Father, that they truly would hear from you and that truly you would bless them. Even as you told Moses to tell Aaron to bless your people, that not only would you bless them, but you would place their name upon them. We ask right now, truly, Lord, even through this prayer, that you would place your name upon them. Ivarekaka Adonai Vishmareka, Ya Er Adonai, Panavileka, Vihuneka, Isa Adonai, Panavileka, the Assembla Kash alone. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. Bashem Yeshua Hamashiach, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.